the speaker. She is an advanced Toastmasters bronze. Her name is Lim Ling Yi. She comes from the land of kiwis. Kiwi fruit and bungee ju jumping. That is New Zealand. New Zealand. She has lived in Malaysia for 30 years with her Malaysian husband and two young adult children. She is a teacher by profession at an international school in Kuala Lumpur and a Toastmaster since 1995. Tonight, she will attend the fourth speech from the Advanced Communication Manual Specialty Speeches called Read Out Loud and the title of the speech is Sambal without anchovies. Please help me welcome Vinny. Why are you being so stubborn? I am. Uh, I'm upset. I don't like the idea. I've already explained it many times. Every cent saved is good for business. The old man sighs and shakes his head. He lifts his face and frowns at Han. There's no defiance in his eyes. His father simply rises from his chair and walks out of the kitchen. But Han feels anger rise inside him. Every time he proposes a new idea to his father, he runs into a brick wall. Nazi Lamak Pak Sama is one of the row of roadside food stores opposite the police station in Kampong Baru. It is a wooden shack with a few long tables and stools, with a small kitchen at the back. The store has not been repainted, nor has furniture been replaced since it was set up 25 years ago, and the metal roof is rusty. Strangely enough, though, these things lend a rustic, surreal charm to the place. Hanif was seven years old when his parents decided to start the business. He still remembers that first day. Being the youngest, Hanif had the privilege of riding up front with his parents, while his two older brothers, Harun and Hafiz, were consigned to the back to sit with the assortment of pots, kitchen utensils, and containers. He remembers the thumping inside his chest when the van stopped in front of the store. Hannah thought it was so cool that his father now owned a Nazi Lamark store. He was now an Anak Tauke, the son of a businessman, a term that he previously thought was reserved for the children of rich Datuks. Well, let's go to work, Aksama had said. Hannah was assigned his sister's mother, while his brothers helped his father set up the tables and chairs. He protested, preferring to be outside doing men's work, rather than inside the small stuffy kitchen helping with the cooking. Yet, as soon as his mother heated up the wok, Hanif was glad that he was there. His mother turned the small kitchen into a paradise of aromatic delights. Hanif, don't just stand there. Please help me slice the cucumbers, his mother said, when, he, when she saw him standing there watching her stir the large wok. His job was easy. He only had to cut the cucumbers into thin slices and then put them in a plastic container. After about an hour, inside the kitchen, the cooking was done. Help me arrange the banana leaves, please, his mother said. So they sat on the wooden stools next to one another. And as she cut the long banana leaves into small square pieces and laid them on the empty plates, it was a tedious and boring job. Why do I have to do this, Mark? The leaf will give out a nice fragrance when we serve the hot rice on it. And after the leaf cutting was done, finally done, he helped his mother carry the containers from the kitchen to the long table outside. A choice of sambal, fried chicken, curry cuttlefish, and hard boiled eggs did not look like a sumptuous spread, but the aroma was wicked. Hannah glanced at his plastic wristwatch. Almost. It was already seven o'clock. Outside, the street became alive. Hanif saw men and women in casual and business attire walking past their store. He saw his father wiping the table nervously for the up time. His eyes trained on every passing pedestrian. It was as if, as if he was trying to throw an invisible net over them and pull them inside the store with sheer force of will. Don't worry, Aya. I'll come soon. I 
kind of said. The words had barely escaped his mouth when a man stepped into the store. The middle-aged man wearing a blue long-sleeved shirt with yellow tie. He's carrying his briefcase. He headed straight towards the boom. His father walked briskly over and stood next to him. For the longest five seconds in the life of Pop Summit's family, the man's eyes examined the containers of food. He turned towards Pop Summit, nodded, and ordered a plate of Nazi Lamar fried chicken. They had their first customer. Hanuk remembers how his father's face had lit up. That is a memory Hanuk would always treasure. But things change after 22 years. From a new wide-eyed Hanuk Tapke, Hanuk grew into a seasoned businessman running restaurants of his own. Now Hanuk feels his father lacks sufficient business acumen and has let too many opportunities slip away. The stall is crowded most mornings, while most of its customers are working for nearby offices. His father's Nazi Lamarck has a strong enough reputation to attract many customers from all over the city. At times, Hanuk wishes that he could be more detached from the store and not give a damn, as his brothers advise. Don't worry too much about it, let Aya do as he pleases, they tell him. But Harun is a school teacher in Jahor Baru, and Hathis works in an accounting firm. But Hana is different. After leaving school, he worked for 12 years in a several hotels before saving up enough money to start his own restaurant business in a popular shopping mall in Pataling Jaya. He inherited his passion for food business from his parents. And no matter where he went or how far he traveled, he would never ever leave that Nazi Lamarck store behind. In many ways, he was the anointed successor of the family business. Hanuf and his father have another disagreement. That evening, Hanuf suggests a change with some bowl recipe. He knows his father pours away the remainder of the sambal at the end of every day. They're unable to keep the sambal overnight because it's cooked with anchovies. If they were to refrigerate it, the chili paste and the onions would be all right. The anchovies would become soggy. Sambal without anchovies? Someone raises his eyebrows. Yes, we could cook the paste and then fry the anchovies separately. We simply add them both together when we serve the rice. But sambal will not taste the same if you cook it without the anchovies. True, but I don't think many will notice the difference. This way, both the sambal and the anchovies can be refrigerated and reduce the wastage. Our customers love our sambal because we make it fresh every morning. Besides, sambal cooked without anchovies will not be right. What's the point of serving something if it's not good? Come on, Aya, all the other stores do it. For a few moments, Summer appears to give the suggestion of pork. He looks at Hannah, Hannah and he smiles, shakes his head, and walks out of the kitchen. Hannah rests his clasped hands on the top of his head in annoyance. Does his father think, still think of him as a clueless kid instead of a successful restaurateur? He really is. Yeah, walk away, ignore the problem. Maybe you don't care about the store anymore, but I still do. And it shouts after him. If Muck were still around, she would be ashamed of the store. His father's steps go dead. Hanna sees his father's body become tense, and he expects him to turn around and confront him. But he does not. And after a few moments, the old man simply walks away. And on his drive home, guilt gnaws at Hanna's heart. That was a dirty, unfair blow that goes about. He should not have used his dear mother's name in vain, much less use it to attack his father. His mother died 10 years ago in a road accident. She was walking home from a Hassan Alam when she was hit by a car. The family spent eight hours waiting at the lobby of the hospital as the doctors tried to save her, her life. It was four o'clock in the morning when a doctor finally approached the family. I'm sorry, she said. And then the doctor said something else to the rest of the family that Hannah was no longer listening. He had just spoken to his he had just spoken to Mother on Global earlier that day. 
who was to follow her to Kanda the next day to shop for the textiles. She had also prompted her cook's favourite, Kipan Chencharu, stuck the chilli paste for dinner. How could she be gone? So soon. So suddenly. Hane? He heard his brother's voice. Harun was giving him some instructions. He was grateful for his eldest brother's composure and strength at times like this. Where is Aya? I have noticed that their father was gone. Aya? He left. He said it was time to open the store, his brother said. Hana couldn't believe. Hana was at work when he gets a call from Nora, his wife. They had agreed to go to a movie that evening, but his wife tells him to cancel the plans. Aya called me a little while ago. He says his car is in the workshop and he needs me to help him pick up something from the store. Something, of course, is a couple of bundles of banana leaves, but Nora knows better than to mention the specifics to her husband. Hannah and his father had an argument over banana leaves yesterday evening. She noticed Hannah getting more and more determined to impose his ideas on his father, and every rejection by the latter only seemed to fortify his resolve. And Park Summer was totally resistant to the idea. It's a waste of money. Nobody cares about these things anymore. That's the way we've been selling Nazi Lamarck, and I intend to continue, his father retorted. Come on, Aya. <coughs> I doubt customers even notice the leaves. You'll only be throwing money away. Banana leaves are not expensive. Every cent saved is a cent gained. I don't need the extra cent. And so by the end of dinner, the men had stopped talking to one another. Some residual bitterness must have carried over the next day, because Park Summer called Nora instead of Hannah to help him collect the leaves from the supplier in Brickfields. Nora has always found Pup Summer to be sweet and gentle and, and had generally liked him from the first time she met him. And when she and Hannah were courting, she wishes the two would get along better. Her husband simply wants to prove a point to the old man for whatever reason. Nora is also baffled by the old man's resistance. She knows Pup Summer is not a stubborn man. When she walks into the kitchen, Park Summer is seated on a stool. Nora is about to call out to him, but something makes her hold her tongue. She stands in the doorway observing him, and she sees Park Summer sitting there, cutting the banana leaves into squares. But there is something peculiar <coughs> about him. His eyes are bright and alert, and he holds a leaf up to examine it as he slices it graceful, fluid motion, and stacking them in a container next to him. And the corners of his mouth curve up in a smile, and his wrinkled face glows. The old man looks younger, more alive and happier than Nora has ever seen. And it is at that moment that all the pieces of the puzzle fall into place. She understands. Hunt comes home late that night. Nora is curled up on bed reading the book. She knows the argument with her father yesterday is bothersome. To her, all the harsh words and posturing are only macho. Deep inside, they are very hurt. And in a way, their behavior only affirms their love for one another. But it will be a cold day in hell before they admit it. Men and their stupid pride. A few minutes later, Hannah flies sullenly beside her. Still angry at Aya? Nora thinks of the potty kettle, expresses her snigger. The two of you are so alike, so stubborn, short-tempered. And after a poise, pause, she says, and romantic. That catches Hannah off guard. What's romance got to do with this? Nora smiles coyly at him and rolls off the bed. She walks towards the dressing table, takes out a shoebox from the lowest drawer. It was four years ago that she had discovered the box, and it still sends shivers down her no, still sends shivers of joy into her heart whenever she touches it, contain the material evidence of her husband's love for her. Inside were memento from their quartering days that Hannah had collected. There were printed emails, movie ticket stubs, and even receipts from their birthday dinners. And Nora pulled out a sheet of paper from the box. Hannah frowns. You don't sort of see the relevance between the box and his father. She holds out the paper, a printout of the first ever email she sent him. 
do you remember what you told me when I asked you about this? Just something for the old days to remember, the times when we were young, and the love we shared, she continued. We're fortunate because we have things like this. Perhaps Aya is not just that lucky. I think he misses your mother. Maybe he has nothing to hold on to except the store and the banana leaves. His wife was right. He has been too stubborn. He had insisted that his father was being unreasonable. Without even trying to understand, he had scolded his father many times for not throwing away all those old pots, without considering the thousands of memories in every one of them. And in his pride, in his own need to prove himself, he had only he had seen only the costs associated with the anomalies. To his father, obviously he saw something else in them. The anomalies were his parents' love letters.